One of the most quotable founding fathers of the United States of America is, of course, Thomas Jefferson, who penned the Declaration of Independence and was a president of the United States, albeit a slave-owning president. And the only book that Thomas Jefferson ever penned was a book entitled Notes on the State of Virginia. It's a very interesting book that really dissects the state of Virginia, going through and talking about the exact description of the limits and boundaries of the state. Uh, In this book, Thomas Jefferson talks about the rivers and how far they are navigable. He talks about the best seaports of the state, how big they are, how big the vessels that they can receive. He talks about the mountains, the cascades, the caverns, the mines, the trees, the plants, the different kinds of fruits that are uh, native to the state. He also talks about the number of inhabitants inhabitants and the militia pay, the description of the Indians established in that state, and on and on and on. It's a fairly interesting read, and I would suggest that most Americans would benefit by reading at least part of the book, at least kind of skimming the book, and the book is available for free online. But what I want to do today is I want to just read you a couple of excerpts from a particular chapter known as the Administration of Justice and the Description of the Laws of Virginia. And we begin on this particular book that I am reading, the notes or notes on the state of Virginia. This is page 132 in my book, but it all depends on which form of the book you have. But in this particular chapter, about halfway through, we're going to read as Thomas Jefferson tells us about the Negro, the Negro slave in the early American colonies, particularly in the state of Virginia. And I begin. It will probably be asked, why not retain and incorporate the blacks into the state and thus save the expense of supplying by importation of white settlers the vacancies they will leave? Deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained, new provocations, the real distinctions which nature has made, and many other circumstances will divide us into parties and produce convulsions, which will probably never end but in the extermination of one or the other race. To these objections, which are political, may be added others, which are physical and moral. The first difference which strikes us is that of color. Whether the black of the Negro resides in the reticular membrane between the skin and the scarf skin, or in the scarf skin itself, Whether it proceeds from the color of the blood, the color of the bile, or from that of some other secretion, the difference is fixed in nature and is as real as if its seat and cause were better known to us. And is this difference of no importance? Is it not the foundation of a greater or less share of beauty in the two races? Are not the fine mixtures of red and white the expressions of every passion by greater or less effusions of color in the one, preferable to that eternal monotony which reigns in the countenances, that immovable veil of black which covers the emotions of the other race? Add to these flowing hair, a more elegant symmetry of form, their own judgment in favor of the whites, declared by their preference of them, as uniformly as is the preference of the orangutan for the black woman over those of his own species. The circumstance of superior beauty is thought worthy of attention in the propagation of our horses, dogs, and other domestic animals. Why not in that of man? Besides, those of color figure, and hair, there are other physical distinctions proving a difference of race. They, the blacks, have less hair on the face and body. They secrete less by the kidneys and are more by the glands of the skin, which gives them a very strong and disagreeable odor. This greater degree of transpiration renders them more tolerant of heat and less so of cold than the whites. Perhaps, too, a difference of structure in the pulmonary apparatus, which a late ingenious experimentalist has discovered to be the principal regulator of animal heat, may have disabled them from extricating, in the act of inspiration, so much of that fluid from the outer air, or obliged them in expiration to part with more of it. They, that is, the blacks, seem to require less sleep. A black, after hard labor through the day, will be induced by the slightest amusements to sit up until midnight or later, though knowing he must be out with the first dawn of the morning. They are at least as brave and more adventuresome 
This may perhaps proceed from a want of forethought, which prevents their seeing a danger till it be present. When present, they do not go through it with more coolness or steadiness than the whites. They, the blacks, are more ardent after their female, but love seems with them to be more an eager desire than a tender, delicate mixture of sentiment and sensation. Their griefs are transient, those numberless afflictions, which render it doubtful whether heaven has given life to us in mercy or in wrath, are less felt and sooner forgotten with them. In general, their existence appears to participate more of sensation than reflection. To this must be ascribed their disposition to sleep when abstracted from their diversions and unemployed in labor. An animal whose body is at rest and who does not reflect must be disposed to sleep, of course. Comparing them, the blacks, by their faculties of memory, reason, and imagination, it appears to me that in memory they are equal to the whites, in reason much inferior, as I think one could scarcely be found capable of tracing and comprehending the investigations of Euclid, and in imagination they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. It would be unfair to follow them to Africa for this investigation. We will consider them here, on the same stage with the whites, and where the facts are not apocryphal on which a judgment is to be formed. It will be right to make great allowances for the difference of condition, of education, of conversation, of the sphere in which they move. Many millions of them have been brought to and born in America. Most of them, indeed, have been confined to tillage, to their own homes, and to their own society. Yet many have been so situated that they might have availed themselves of the conversation of their masters. Many have been brought up to the handicraft arts, and from that circumstance have always been associated with the whites. Some have been liberally educated, and all have lived in countries where the arts and sciences are cultivated to a considerable degree, and all have had before their eyes samples of the best works from abroad. The Indians, with no advantages of this kind, will often carve figures on their pipes not destitute of design and merit. They will crayon out an animal, a plant, or a country, so as to prove the existence of a germ in their minds, which only wants cultivation. They astonish you with strokes of the most sublime oratory, such as prove their reason and sentiment strong, their imagination glowing and elevated. But never yet could I find that a black had uttered a thought above the level of plain narration, never saw even an elementary trait of painting or sculpture. In music, they are more generally gifted than the whites with accurate ears for tune and time, and they have been found capable of imagining a small catch. Whether they will be equal to the composition of a more extensive run of melody or of complicated harmony is yet to be proved. Misery is often the parent of the most affecting touches in poetry. Among the blacks is misery enough, God knows but no poetry. I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. This unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle in the emancipation of these people.